Hello YouTube and welcome to an amount of episodes of Koyomi Monogatari back here again today for more Monogatari series. Uh, the reason I say that being that, hey, I'm going to do two and then we're going to see about a third. It's that kind of day to day, a little bit, not under the weather, just a little bit bleh, you know. Um, so, so we'll see how we go. We're still getting something out there. But yeah, with the caveat that we may be a little bit lower on energy today. Uh, which is unfortunate, but hopefully... I don't think this will be like a hype action scene Monogatari, let's put it that way. So it may match the tone a little bit, uh, in my opinion. Another thing I'll talk about before I continue is that my camera angle may be slightly different. I know pe most people don't care. This is probably just a me thing. Um, I, I like dropped my webcam. <laughs> don't ask me how it happened. Um, so I had to readjust it, and I don't like. Re I, I thought I had it pretty good, but I had it perfect. So um, frustrating for me to to say the least. But either way, I'm sure that's only a me thing that I only care about. Uh, either way, on with the comments that have an interesting structure this week. So the kind of like the, the the main thing that I'll do here is Gian Bueno's comment, and then uh, MC Steve's comment here. And then uh, Mo Temo's comment here, I believe. Yes. So it is characterized by three longer comments that I'll be diving into uh, with a few ancillary ones in between by Cochin and Simon. So yeah, starting, of course, with Gian Bueno, just compliments me straight up. I did think last week came out pretty well. I thought I made some good points and we'll see how much they match up to other commenters' feelings in very shortly but yeah like when i when i finish a recording session and i go hey i thought that was pretty damn good i'm generally like pretty pretty chuffed with it you know so we're keeping on the trend of bringing up the cut first chapters of these particular arcs in koyomi monogatari uh continuing with the theme of roads so for koyomi sand um hachikuji gets asked the question about roads and um how they always meet out on roads and how uh how her take on that is manifest that I guess it, just from the very start I found this very interesting I never really thought about it but yeah you did you don't really see Hachikuji indoors very often I think we've seen her in the cream school like maybe once um other than that like yeah she's always out on the move again talking to probably something that she is doing when she passed away when when the car hit her right um she was walking on a road to see her mother Yes, mother. So again, that kind of aberration-y nature thing coming through there. I thought I thought that was an interesting point that I didn't really consider before that. But her take on roads themselves are pretty practical. Just some place to walk as far as she is concerned. Yeah, in fact, Araragi actually questions this and then, no, she continues. Like, it's just for walking. No matter what road it is, uh, is a space that connects one place to another. Wherever it begins, wherever it ends, that never changes. You wouldn't normally call a dead end a road, would you? In other words, you think, or you can think, what kind of road is this anyway, or where does it lead to, or this road is unstable, or it seems like it might collapse at any moment, or I'd rather be on a different road, but there's one thing you mustn't do. The moment you break that taboo, the road ceases to be a road. Which is very monogatari definition-y. And yeah, just the, the poignant end to it, what is that taboo we speak of? It's to stop walking. So whatever you do, do not stop walking on that road. Again, like road is such a... So let's say in high school, because uh, this is how it works in Australia anyway for, for our system, or at least New South Wales. Uh, the whole entire year 12, like everybody, the whole syllabus, was given a single word that's very broad to base most of their English work on. Right. So ours, I believe, was discovery, but another year's was journey. And journey is just road. And road is a such a broad metaphor that you can apply to anything where the most natural thing that I'm applying this to is life. The road of life. Do not stop walking on the road of life. How does that relate to Aragi's feelings throughout the show? I think it relates very, very well. We're contrasting this immediately with the conversations with Kambaru on water, where, of course, Hachikuji and him were talking about stopping. Interestingly enough, Hachikuji talking about stopping on a road as well. She kind of just kept going. She kept on chugging, right, until she ran out of room to go. When reality caught up with her, you know. But it, 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 Saruga, uh, uh, Kambaru, ro roads are for running. So again, two pretty simple characters. Like, this is a very, very simple take. You've got to run on that road. And she certainly does during Hanamonogatari. 
Great scene, by the way. The place where you run isn't a road, it's a track. And then Araragi starts to ruminate. Doesn't track imply some absolute fixed route? Where Kambaru responds that, hey, aren't all roads just fixed? If it's, it, it's like a street. You can't like deviate from a street, really. And changing lanes on said road is a simple matter. Or no simple matter, actually. It's, it's very difficult. So we're all following some set of rules on the road of life. Uh, it's not so easy to deviate from said path. Changing lanes is difficult traffic metaphors broadly in the show as well and apparently dropping out of said lanes isn't really that hard in truth you can be going full tilt or not full tilt but that doesn't mean you're actually making progress one direction or the other and then we're relating this to wind with nadeko taking on a full on stopping or making a u-turn in part of our metaphor right what about the people that don't even look at the road Averting one's eyes, potentially, with Nadeko. Aragi doesn't even speak to Nadeko in this chapter. He just merely concludes that she probably doesn't think about roads all that much. It may be a rude thing to say, but it's not without evidence. But he doesn't necessarily think this is a bad thing either. Contrasting her, like, looking at herself rather than looking at the road, something which Araragi doesn't even do himself, really. And we can add that into the show. We hardly ever get an Araragi POV shot that looks like down at his body. I can't even think of... Actually, no, I can think of exactly one time that happened. I used it in a thumbnail. Just scratch that, I'm being stupid. And yeah, there's pros and cons to Nadeko's approach. So, again, you can look down, straight down, see your feet. Your feet keep moving. I'm going to be making progress on this road. Um, I know that I'm going to be going at a certain pace, but I can't really see what's in front of me. When you take the low road, you're taking the path of the snake. A real one. Ooh, interesting. And the path of the snake, you've got no feet to look down at. You're kind of already on the floor, you know? These, again, are some pretty introspective chapters overall. I hope this was entertaining for everybody else watching. I found it very entertaining, actually. And I'll see about this structure. I'm going to imagine that I'm going to do two then three then two just probably that's the feeling right now but yeah thanks gian bueno for the comment now on to simon's comment retroactive memory replacement aka deja vu is another example of causality and consequence changing its order does it have to apply to every episode of the season no does it have to have any meaning to the story overall no probably not but yeah accepting a reality check from such a strange show like monogatari is really hard for us to do I'm reading this comment, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm reading it as kind of like, hey, pray, maybe don't try to apply everything you see and everything to everything all at once. But I also think that's the beauty of Monogatari, that you can attempt to do things like that. I find that, I find pleasure in that. I find that rewarding. I find that level of analysis rewarding, I think. It's a very interestingly told story with this coming way after the fact of these events happening, at least for what I've seen right now, right? We're talking to events of Baki and Nisei Monogatari over the past couple of weeks, really. Um, which is, it's very interesting to me. It's going back and kind of, hey, just fleshing out what the characters were maybe thinking at certain points here and how does that lead to our logical conclusion. So yeah, I don't know. I, I'm going to keep doing it the way I'm doing it. It's pretty neat. I like, I like my videos, I think. Um, next comment here from Cochin. Uh, in Kaiji, the whole premise is about having a huge debt, so that was one of my questions last week uh, about the Kaiji reference. So, yeah, he does have a huge debt, apparently. I think somebody else told me this on, on Discord as well. Uh, yeah, I, I hear that show's good, or the manga's good or something as well. Maybe I should check it out at some point or another, I don't know. Next, on to MC Steve's comment here. The starting part, just a bit of a clarification for last week's comment before moving on to some stuff about each of the individual elements that we're dealing with over the course of last week's three. But first, starting off with a little bit of a thing about, hey, th there's a line towards the beginning of, of Flower where, like, <laughs> it kind of brushes away, or not brushes away, like, actually what Senju Kahara and Araragi are walking back from in Koyomi Flower is Oshino again fixing, fixing what happened with Araragi like in the little kind of epilogue portion of um, uh, Hitagi Crab, where he gains the weight, right? Well, I just thought it was like a cute little thing. They actually address it in this part. So again, if you're like lame, you can call it a plot hole, but I just think it's a cute little reference. So Sand, we're looking into Sand, uh, probably not that deeply as the others, um, but more just like the natural concept and natural order of things idea that, again, I'm applying to Hachikuji. Generally all about perception and intersects the concepts of oddities where 
you begin to see oddities when you have that certain perspective on them as you like discover more and more oddities more and more show up you know and yeah the darkness connection is to be made potentially a demon face indicating orni monogatari references as well an absolute law of nature is that darkness not a character but something more like weather an absolute cause of or absolute law of principle you know you can't fuck with it it's the it's the rules you know this particular soundtrack i believe it was jazzy and bossa nova inspired um was actually a bakemonogatari soundtrack that didn't make it into the anime so it's cool that they included it here and we're following a little bit of the chronology of the composers there uh one of which working on kaguya sama which i'm a fan of water probably my favorite one from last week as well just had the best banter i thought the um the dialogue from both senju gahara and kambara was really good there was some some scuttlebutt on discord about uh p- potentially this being important later but i don't really know much beyond that so just full disclosure there but yeah mostly a silly superstition about the fate of love reminding uh mc steve somewhat of the emotion versus logic theme from Mail, which again the, the it's the it's Kambaru versus Shinobu basically right where where Kambaru is firmly on the side of uh, emotion where Shinobu is a little bit more logical about everything and yeah apparently my male reaction helped uh, people to notice this too so so good that is that is literally the textbook of what I want to do with this kind of thing watching other people react to my favorite shows has taught me many many things about my favorite shows and given me many new perspectives on things that's kind of what I'm trying to offer here. Again, a little bit more scuttlebutt about this potentially being important later, so yeah, we'll say, we'll say, we're keeping it on the back burner. What I can say about Toei's family, which is not included in the anime, uh, wish I remember which part, is that yeah, there is a loping involved. The Gaian clan is prestigious, and while the Kanbaru family isn't, there is a family conflict, but that does not stop them from getting together. Suruga past, or oh, Suruga with past parents lives with Kambaru. So the parents are dead, living with Kambaru grandma. Gotcha. So yeah, it's a little bit of, um, there's some drama there, right? It definitely seems like this guy in name, again, Guy Nazuko being the, the biggest kind of evidence of it, is something. There's something going on there. There's crazy stuff, right? Moving on to wind, to catch wind of, talk of legends, gossips, hearsay, even relating uh, some of the these rumors and stuff to be viral in nature. Potentially one of the connections I could have made with Pandemic is the whole Karen B sickness situation as well, which I thought was was interesting. I kind of noted that during editing. And then the Deco party, yeah, it's kind of terrifying, right? Um, everything's so fucked. <laughs> I think it's basically the worst we've seen her and is the closest we've seen her currently to what like what led her to the events and the delusions of a Tory. Yeah, she she's she is Hanakawa if she was hopeless. As Koi concludes, she has backwards priorities and her mind is jumbled. Uh she's actually going to be perfect as a mangaka as a result. <laughs> The Gaian and Hachikuji Presents bit is more as, as a gag for the series' commentaries, apparently. Since the Baki's commentaries, there's been a gag that Hachikuji is the anime's producer, Hachikuji P. <laughs> that's, that's kind of funny, I like that. Novel-wise, this starts in Nisei, but did not make it into the anime. Um, Gaian, well, that makes more sense. Why she's presenting stuff, it would make the most sense if it just said Gaian Izuko Presents, because she's the most, most like fourth-wall, authorial character in the show. And yeah, we're... I think another commenter talks about it potentially later or somebody else maybe it was on Discord. A lot of Kaiki's theory and strategy here can be applied economically as well. It's almost like marketing, like advertising. Um, you've got to have a market that's ready for these kind of ideas to introduce them into it, right? You've got to spread it through people that actually want it and then get word of mouth involved. I, 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 thought, I found that interesting with all of the, the kind of Kaiki money stuff as well. And this is why I think I'm enjoying Koyomi Monogatari the most. I feel like I'm engaging with the mystery of it all and trying to figure out what it's trying to say. Um, It's a little bit left field. Some of it may just seem kind of irrelevant until you dig a little bit deeper and find some stuff. I don't know. I I find it really, really interesting and a really great way to tell a story and to beef out a story that kind of already existed. Last comment here by Motemo. Uh, going through, again, the similar structure where we're going three, four, five, talking about them 
in three separate paragraphs essentially. So particularly only seeing what's on the surface instead of digging deeper, applying that to Mayoi. Uh, Koyomi only seeing the surface of the situation. With her, the supernatural, why did she stay after going home? We don't elaborate on that. We're seeing the kind of cracks below as the natural cause of things, potentially representing the darkness. We're also talking about Hanakawa, potentially representing the darkness in that similar story. So Hanakawa in uh, Koyomi Sand talks to, hey, there's a hole down there and then the sand's going through and it's a natural occurrence. The darkness in Onimonogatari is essentially doing the same thing. Uh, revealing what the natural occurrence of the world is and why things are happening the way they're happening. Thanks to Gainazuko broadly, Mayo was able to pass away naturally instead of being absorbed by the darkness. You could even say the sand itself was being moved from the box in our little metaphor before it fell down the crack. Interesting. Episode 4 being a personal favourite with the comedy hitting and the story still being kind of silly but interesting regardless. From my memory, the name Saruga means river, so her name literally contains water in it. And then we scroll down, uh, and then we'll get into this. Isn't Didn't Oshino say Saruga means torture bondage? It also could mean that, yeah, the characters in Kanji are fast person and river. Water-themed names are common in Gaian clan. It is also said that the first two Kanji of the word Japanese bondage torture. So, <laughs> again, Nisiwa Sin and names... Um, fast person and river make a lot of sense, as does Japanese bondage torture. <laughs> they all make a lot of sense for Kambaru. And Simon here, a little bit critical of anime parents naming conventions for their kids, which could go on for days and days and days. This is my area because it's probably just seeing things way too deep, but I kind of agree. So Saruga not focusing on her reflected face, but instead her boobs may talk to her kind of anime perception as a a perverted Genki girl that doesn't really have much beyond it, where that is kind of shattered in Hanamonogatari, where we kind of get to see below that a little bit more, and after that point in the series, Kambara's probably got a little bit more going on. There's actually a scene in the bath in Hanamonogatari where her face is kind of covering her boobs, so maybe the, the kind of inversion of that visually. And I've talked about Hanamonogatari being surprisingly one of the least lewd slash perverted seasons, because again, it's it's not Araragi perception, it's not his point of view, it's Kambaru perception. Kambaru doesn't see herself as attractive. I don't know, maybe she does, but like, and I don't think it would fit tonally for that season either. Yeah, I think that's a great choice. This may even extend to her not seeing her true self in a way, right? Only seeing things on a surface level and needing to dig deeper. Focus on herself beyond the surface, maybe even similar to the sandpit idea from before. Oh, I like this too, right? Um, rumors and deception points in Nadeko, who was following the wind, you could say. Forced into this act, adorable by environment and people around her forcing this perception upon her, she became what she was perceived as before it popped. And we could talk to almost the party then, maybe a little bit of a balloon metaphor too. So too much wind and then pop. She could be easily deceived in even uh, Koi Monogatari because she wasn't satisfied with her life. She believed she was satisfied with her life in that season, but in reality she wasn't. There was still something beyond that that made her easy to deceive. And as soon as uh, Kaiki caught wind of that, he's like, hey, I can deceive this girl pretty easily. So that's even some backfill for a lot of the um, the understanding of Koi Monogatari as well. We even extend beyond that for why Kaiki's initial kind of lie about um, Koyomi, Hitagi, and Shinobu dying in a car crash, why that doesn't work on Nadeko. It may, you know, offer some kind of pointlessness for what's going on, but beyond Nadeko not even, like, believing it, Nadeko, it doesn't offer hope for Nadeko in some way out of it as well, right? There's no, there's no way to reach what he's selling. So, Nadeko clinging on to this godhood thing, if she heard about this, of course her first goal would be, or first idea would be to deny this, to continue trying to be this god. You need to offer something better, something that she wants more to get her out of it. I'm actually loving this take. Um, this episode, kind of that arc, Koyomi Wind, retroactively makes a lot of 
uh, Koi Monogatari make sense and what Kaiki was thinking through that time, with the money of course being involved and using that as a motivating factor by the end of it all as well. That last part with Kaiki advising Koyomi about looking around to see what is happening during the current times if there is a bad omen or pandemic clearly didn't make Koyomi put that advice into action because he keeps avoiding looking at Orgi's role, averting his eyes to the cause and only looking at the end result of that cause only looking at the situations that she causes and not how it happened or who made it happen. So Kaiki potentially like foreshadowing or giving Araragi some advice that could pertain to the Orgi situation that he is not following. Again, we're going to see if this is the right take out of Orgi or the wrong one. Is Koyomi being stupid and dumb and should know better and is easily fooled? Or is that all okay to happen? Actually having some trust in people and not suspecting everybody you see at every point all the time. I do not know. I do not know what our take is going to be in the end. Um, for the record, I liked a lot of these interpretations. For just future reference, I have recorded for about half an hour on like three comments. So if we could <laughs> turn it down a little bit. Well, I mean, I could talk less as well. I think it's a two kind of pronged thing there. I don't know, brevity would be somewhat appreciated a little bit more. But also I find it all very interesting as well, and my videos aren't brief. It's a, it's, it's, it's a struggle for me to figure out what we're actually doing. Um, either way, I'll move on to the timeline where I like won't talk about anything really because none of it's going to be relevant for what we're talking about next, our last one being in August. What I wanted to talk about most of all is the next one being in September. So, follow me on this one. We're going to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and we're here. So that was a lot of scrolling and this is the next thing that happens after August 24th-ish when I think Neko Shiro slash Shinobu Mail ends, right? The next thing we see is Orgi Formula Awari Monogatari stuff, which is broadly October, I think. So we have no clue what happens in September. No kind of, like, fallout for all of August's events, really, in the immediate aftermath. And even in Orgy Formula, so much of it is focused on Orgy and Co. That being Hanakawa, Araragi, um, Sodachi, if that's even relevant. Um, the, the, we, yeah, we don't really get much direct follow-up. So it'll be very interesting to see our first real look into September. You know? The other thing is, I don't think we have a logical character to base it on. Maybe like a Yotsuki? Maybe? Kaganui? Maybe? Maybe like a, a guy in Azuko? But I would imagine you'd be like leaving that one for a little bit later. Of course, you've got to do an Orgi one, potentially even a Sodachi one later on down the line. If you were going to do a Sodachi one, maybe it would be um, the second episode today. But I think I'm just rambling a little bit and should move on regardless. But yeah, we're going to get some September content. So right there, we're going to get ready. We're going to get ready to put something right there. Either way, just my show stuff before I get started here. If you like the video, consider liking the video. If you like the video and you want to see more, consider subscribing to the channel. Comment below anything you thought about the episode, anything I could do to improve my presentation. Comment below. I'm doing follow for follow on Twitter. So follow me on Twitter if you'd like me to follow you back. And the Discord. Join Discord. Love Discord. Discord, Discord, Discord. And yeah, leading on to episode 6 of Koyomi Monogatari right now. Radio, I have a very dark episode uh, 6 of Koyomi Monogatari up here ready to go. Let me pop that up there. Uh, 15 minutes and 2 seconds. A little bit of a longer one here today. Um, there's going to be the, the subs that I'm using, which are the Toy, toy Shui subs. True. Um, and there will be a picture in picture provided below. So yeah, just going to give it a 3, 2, 1. Radio. 3, 2, 1. Go. Oh, I forgot about the sisters. Oh, of course. Okay. <laughs> it's almost, um, Scar, no? With the, uh, with the very strong brass. I think I'm, I'm sure I've made that reference before. But of course, this is Karen. If we're trying to put these two together, these two episodes, you could potentially imply that the next episode will be about Tsukihi. Tsukihi during October. Interesting.
But again, that's future stuff. I don't know if I would say I lament it, but I think it's interesting that the sisters are such a big part of Nisei, and they're kind of not really around much again. Besides some small moments, I mean, Sukihi's got a large role in Nekokuro, I think. That conversation at the start being probably the best part about that arc, honestly. Animation's pretty slick too, no? Um, other than that, they're just kind of bit roles, joke characters, kind of. I mean, they don't have a dedicated arc again, is my point. Uh, if something looked weird there, I didn't have subtitles on. So I added subtitles on. Uh, it said Koyomi Tree. So I got that far, and then I saw her go like Onichan, and then it had no subs. There you go. Leaf September or late September. Sorry, it's kind of sh it's kind of rocked me to my core. All right, with the dojo, there's a bunch of bugs around. <laughs> On the little the the, the hair ahoge. Okay, quick chapter. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Stop distracting me. I'm trying to study. What did I say about Nisei? This is some Nisei type content. She loves that, um, <laughs> that particular piece of clothing as well. <laughs> Did we need the, like, adjective twice? Very descriptive of your sisters. Yeah, I mean, you're right. If we're comparing. Okay. Where's my content? What? Yeah, not sh not sure that'll hold up in a um court of justice. Okay. <laughs> yare yare. Yeah, righto. Righto, Oshino. Please don't beat me up, little sister. Okay, so coerced, deeply into going and seeing this tree. No, that's not the objective, really. The objective is you're, like, coercing me. Reticent character. Okay, that was a very Japanese joke, too. Get off my bed. <laughs> Alright, yeah, get me get onto the tree, please. It's a dead tree. I can give you that much. No, it's like a tree.
you keep forcing them on me. Please. I don't think it's growing. It looked dead as shit. What time of year would it be there? Autumn, right? Going into winter? Okay, everybody just simultaneously noticed the tree at once. No, I don't think they did. I think we're talking about perception and noticing things broadly. How so? I guess. Okay. Yeah. Mm hmm. Okay, this is a bit more interesting. I like the shot too. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure it's that, yeah, <laughs> that important. Mm. You were the only one that felt that way, like you wanted to kill yourself because of a tree. Okay, it's a tree. It is a really conspicuous spot, so you'd think you would see it. Just put a fence around it. We won't get chopped down. Okay. Okay. What are you going to do? <laughs> Oh, look at the wall. I remember that gag. Oh, I love the hair. Yeah, of course you would, if I'm following the metaphor correctly. Oh, the room. At least she's in a room. We'll take that. Yeah. Good old word search. What kind of pandemic panic? Oh, of of being scared about the tree. Okay, kind of leading off of the wind stuff from last week. Yeah, vaccines. What are we going to do? Okay, wanted our little epilogue. That's good.
Yeah. I agree. Exactly. Okay. Oh. Okay. So we just changed the phenomenon a little bit. <laughs> I'd use that story too. Well, yeah, pretty obviously. That's good. Okay. Okay. I agree. Also true. Perception. Okay. Um, it's extremely broad is my thought. You could take that in a million different directions. I think the most obvious direction to take it, though, would be Aragi as the plant, as the sapling metaphor, and growing up into that. You could take that when we're talking about the tree and perception of it and changing the perception and changing the phenomenon. You see Aragi climbing higher and higher. Kind of compare that with the shadow of the tree growing in the previous scene when he's talking with Karen as well. So there's a lot of stuff there, but then I think like perception being important is like a broad thing we've seen in Koyomi as well. Um, there's the stuff about the pandemic and the spread of a rumor that is a direct link to the previous entry in, in this season, I guess. Um, we have some nice Hanakawa tidbits about what her living situation's like in the immediate aftermath of everything that happens in August. Then, of course, we're linking it even further on to all the Awari stuff, right? Again, perception. What does Araki perceive in all of this, right? Creating aberrations accidentally out of his own thoughts and stuff as well. A ton of stuff. A ton. And boobs. And yeah, moving on to some analysis on Koyomi Monogatari, episode 6. So first off, I guess a broad apology about the weird stuff with the with the reaction itself, with the subs not being on because I'm stupid. Um, other than that, the episode itself, it took a while to get going, but once it did, I thought the concepts, whilst broad, were pretty interesting. Again, I feel like you could take this in a million different directions, even whilst writing this, I thought of a couple more. Um, the, the talk of 
attaching something spiritual and giving it meaning and building almost like a shrine gave me a Tori Monogatari vibes with the Nadeko situation. I thought that this broadly was similar to the the stone as well, Koyomi Stone, where it's Araragi and Hanakawa, or mostly Araragi, talking about the fact that something that they did resulted in an aberration being born. Uh, the group perception of something shifting and that potentially causing something to happen and what are the long-term ramifications of this? Is this a good short-term band-aid solution or is it a actual like good thing for long-term stuff? Uh, I, I guess I'll go into this now and, and talk about a couple of other ideas. Uh, this episode is about a tree that showed up at the dojo where Karen trains and Karen's thoughts about it broadly and why she likes it and whilst the rest of the populace don't really like it. They find it a little bit scary. She basically extorts, question mark, information out of Araragi about some boob stuff, about that he likes touching her boobs, which we have seen before, for the record. Uh, I hate that this is actually thematically relevant as we move into the latter portion of the episode with Hanakawa and the boob wall, which I'm sure I've seen somewhere before because it's ringing a bell. You could even talk about our broad theme in the episode of growth. Uh... And how that attaches to, to breasts as well, even though that's a little bit of a, a gross line to take. Either way, I should get onto the actual con content. So so everybody just like basically everybody just noticed it at the same time, right? Everybody. It just kind of showed up. And people find that scary. But some of the adults don't really mind it that much, right? So this got me thinking, right? What is this tree representing? If we take the Araragi point of view on everything and the growth of a plant over time to turn into a tree is a broad kind of monogatari Araragi metaphor. I think it represents human growth. I think it represents the growth from adolescence into adulthood broadly, a, a coming of age. That's why the adults don't mind whilst the students are scared of it. The students are scared of it because they don't understand it, but the adults may understand it a little bit better having gone through that process. Karen is also fond of this process, is, is fond of seeing something grow. If we're attaching that to Araragi, you can see her feelings from Karen B around respect around Araragi and his growth going forward and him actually studying and trying to get better and all these other things. And maybe her path broadly following his in some kind of weird way as well, that she likes the tree. She wants it to stick around. So please, Araragi, protect that tree, protect that growth. To which Araragi immediately goes to Hanakawa for help with helping Karen. Uh, Hanakawa, for the record, likes the tree too. Broadly, again, attaching it to Araragi in my mind. And then the plan is essentially like most of the plans in Koyomi Monogatari, it seems. It's a shift in perspective. It's a change of tact. It's a, it's broadly metaphorical about other parts of the show. Um, we're suggesting the idea of the tree as a sacred element of the dojo and one that takes on more importance as kind of a spiritual thing, even suggesting that its wood was even used as the foundations of the dojo. Another thing for me that is linking it to Koyomi Stone, where Araragi's woodwork creation housed that uh, faux aberration. Again, this group perception now of this tree is something that is literally being used for the situation that we're in right now. This place wouldn't exist without this tree. Maybe thinking that this perception of it may have shifted into the reality of what has happened, because what is reality beyond group perception of things, right? And again, I feel like I'm barely scratching the surface. I feel like it's a very easy answer to say that the Koyomi tree is Koyomi. Um, I feel like you could attach that to way more stuff, right? Um, again, we're, we're doing the thing, what immediately preceded this, a bunch of August stuff. So that's linking into a lot of our Hanakawa perception stuff as well from that stuff. Um, what's after that? Owari. We started Augie formula after that. And that is all about perception, all about forgetting, right? So, so did this tree actually just show up? Or did everybody just not notice it for a while and then all collectively notice it again? Kind of like what happens to Araragi and Augie formula and Augie, no, Sadachi riddle and Sadachi lost and, and all that stuff. Just kind of forgot about it for a while. <laughs> is everybody as forgetful as Araragi? Or am I overanalyzing it? And it's a lot more simple than I think it is. And it's just about a tree. I don't know. I'm trying to see how this 
attaches itself to Karen in a more concrete way as well. I guess we could talk to the pandemic idea and the spreading of it that way and talk to maybe a Kaiki connection. Again, Kaiki's always been perceived as a dead tree as well. And I always commented in the episode that this tree was dead. I don't know. <laughs> she still says the tree's growing, though. I, I, it doesn't look like it's growing. It's also autumn, so maybe it's just shedding its leaves, like trees tend to do. Uh, but all the other trees in the background haven't, but maybe they're different breed of tree, <laughs> whatever you call a tree. Um, yeah, I don't know. Something happened. Maybe I'll find more if I bring the episode up. So yeah, I went through that Karen B opening again without really reading the lyrics. So I'm going to watch through it again, once again now and read through the lyrics. Yeah, broadly about the events of Karen B, I would describe it as, um, kind of, Hey, I'm, I've got this Heroes of Justice thing going on. Don't really think about it. Hold hold my hand. We'll stay together as a family and do all that kind of stuff. I'll lead us along. But I understand your perception on things broadly, Araragi, as well. That's what I'm getting from these lyrics. So again, Koyomi Tree, September. Got to miss this bark pattern here that we're displaying our stuff on. We're all, again, relating it to the tree. So this is where we like get a little look at the tree first. Of a nighttime in front of the moon. Kind of the chime going off and then this kind of being like the rings of the tree almost spinning and the chime the chime immediately made me think of like something supernatural right and this is the tree it's a dead tree it looks like really dead and when we see it later with all like the dummies out around it's very conspicuous it's kind of in the middle of like the the ground that they would use the train it's like it popping up in the middle of a sporting field it would make not a lot of sense to mine. Yeah, that, that's the better shot, right? Like, why would nobody notice this tree not before now, right? It's clearly important. But again, we've seen characters in Monogatari not remember important stuff before, you know? Then we're winding back to the first portion of the episode where Araragi is studying for exams, broadly trying to grow, you could say, before he was interrupted <laughs> by um, Karen. And her features, <laughs> let's say, uh, which is a it, it felt it felt like a big callback to some of that Nisei stuff. It felt like the biggest or the most etchy we've been in a while. I think so, at least. So again, she's she's rubbing her her titties on his head to try to get him to, or well, get his attention, and then get him to go somewhere with her about the tree. Araragi agrees to <laughs> at least hear her out as long as she gets her boobs off of him. Uh, they are not as big as Hanakawa's. It's a good thing that he's comparing as well. Then we start to extort him a little bit, right? It's like, you touch your sister's breasts too much, and we're going to use that information to get stuff from you, me and Tsukihi. How outrageous of one to say that, as they say, blessings are upon the head of the just. Um, something was just upon his head, I'll give you that. I do like this, though. Like, um, the, uh, like, like, Araragi finally turns away from his books, goes, so what do you want? Oh, I guess I have no choice but to tell you. Like, she wasn't the one annoying him the entire time about it. She asks for Araragi's help. Araragi gives her the line that Oshino gives everybody that people just help themselves out on their own. And then, yeah, she, she threatens to beat him up. I'm, you, I need you to help me. I'm going to beat you up if you don't help me. Yeah, Karen's kind of all over the place this episode. She's, like, cutesy and, like manic and fucked up uh it's big little sister energy not that i have one but it's what i would imagine having one is like just broadly kind of annoying <laughs> i think just probably with less incest i would say in reality some about kyaku senbi and the other one and legs or something i don't know it kind of went over my head yeah kyoku senbi and kyaku senbi yeah this one means something about a curve like a like a womanly curve and the other one something about a leg and then we finally we get onto the tree that's like a good like quarter of the episode <laughs> so tree discovered on the dojo grounds everyone thinks it's a nuisance i want to help it out so other students potentially looking at growth and stunting it maybe originally Araragi doesn't understand the discovery angle of it all what do you what do you mean discovered a tree? The tree's always been there. But again, that's the supernatural aspect and that's what um, gets people riled up and that's why you need Araragi's supernatural help. It's not for snapping. It's not for lumber. It's a growing tree, a tree with roots. So the roots metaphor links into like everything going on in Monogatari. Um, 
about sinking deep roots to grow and that kind of thing, even linking it to some of the water stuff. Like, talking about natural objects with links to real things is very, very broad. You can apply it to lots of stuff. I do like this shot a lot, kind of just the overhead just drifting around. It's a very cheap shot, but it's quite effective. I actually think it's a pretty cool cost-cutting measure for an episode that otherwise is... I don't know, fairly unremarkable production-wise. It's it's fine. It's good. There's a lot of boobs in it. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. This is probably the, the highlight shot for mine, I think. The two actually facing each other, figuring out this problem. It's kind of, I don't know. The perception on top, giving an overall view of the situation as we're expositing stuff. So Karen was also the first one to spot the tree. Nobody had realized it was there, not even the dojo owner, and she was the first one that saw it. Again, I'm thinking broadly connecting it to Aragi stuff or Kaiki stuff because we're talking about like spreading a rumor and pandemic stuff, which we were just talking about as well, as well as Kaiki metaphorically being that dead tree. Karen being the first one to discover it, also being one of the first ones to try to thwart him upon hearing about it from her justice sister or fire sister work. And yeah, we, we get this, right? Um, this tree kind of growing in this shadow as we're explaining things, right? Again, talking to its growth. Again, I'm thinking mirroring Aragi climbing up his wall from the boobs later on. We get to talking about it being kind of scary. It's the first thing Aragi brings up, like this fully grown tree that nobody's like planted in here just shown up out of nowhere. It's kind of spooky. And that's exactly it. Everybody says that the tree is scary or spooky. Our master doesn't say that, of course, but the untrained senpai and kohai are all scared. Interesting. So yeah, again, all the all the kids, right? The master, the adult, not so scared about the growth, not so scared about that movement. The same way it's like, hey, Aragi's growth through the show may be off-putting to some, but from an adult, like, that's where there's no... Or the adults in the show are extremely competent they're extremely on side they understand everything they have a way different perception on everything basically they look at Araragi's things and they go oh you where everyone else treats it with such severity again it's the difference in perspective between teenage years when you're actually in them and upon recollection of that stuff seem seeming quaint uh in kind of retrospect again there's this line about karen like I was so embarrassed. That was my first feeling, like not, not fear, but embarrassment of not noticing it earlier. I hoped everyone else would share the same mindset, but nobody felt it that way. Um, like that similar way. You could almost relate this to the Justice Sister stuff, like nobody believes in it as strongly as her. Instead of being scared of something, she's embarrassed she didn't notice it sooner and wants to fix the situation and rectify everything. Full Justice Sister style. They're saying it's scary. They're saying we should chop it down. And of course, Karen stepping up, kind of different to her peers and wanting to do the right thing regardless of everything. So yeah, Karen's goal, resolving things so that the tree doesn't get chopped down, keeping the tree in its space. It doesn't look scary uh, now that we all know about it, right? My request is that this tree can stay here forever. Araragi agrees to the request. You can trust your trustworthy big brother. What exactly are you going to do? I'll do something. Smash cut to like bowing before Hanakawa trying to get her to help. Uh, which has been a theme, for sure. Hanakawa just piping up with the perfect thing to say for, to, to fix what's going on. It was in uh, stone. It was in sand. So, a couple of times there. So yeah, asking her and then saying you can do whatever you want with your boobs too. What? <laughs> of course she can. They're hers. Um... I don't want to talk about, like, the wall of boobs climbing up it to, like, indicate growth in Araragi as the tree grows larger, the plant grows larger. That's very crass, but you could say that boob represent female character, and then he's using all these experiences with female character to grow. That is extremely weird. <laughs> I don't know about all that. The first thing we ask Hanakawa is, does she agree with Karen or the others? And of course she agrees with Karen. No hesitation at all that the tree should stay and the tree is important. If the tree is still alive, it's inconceivable to dispose of it without sufficient cause. The tree is still alive, it's still growing, 
why get rid of it? We get a good look at Hanakawa's room here, a couple of maps, potentially planning out some travel, as well as a suitcase. Got a bit of a moon thing going on, of course, there's been the, the kind of Hanakawa jewel personality at night idea as well. I would imagine she's got a futon somewhere, packed away in that, in that cupboard. At least she's not sleeping on the floor. And actually, from memory, this is the room that she walks out into in the end of Nekoshiro. Um, I seem to recognize the floor randomly enough. I guess this is their new home after the other one burnt down, right? I think. Um, yeah, so I found that neat. There's some post stuff in the immediate aftermath of what was it, late August? This is late September. After a month of kind of moving in, she's even got a house plant. It's like every like 20-something's first home. Amazing. She talks a little bit to the perception of the tree. Um just that nobody was conscious of the tree being there till now. It didn't appear. It's just a consciousness thing. Once you're conscious of it, you become really conscious of it, and then you notice it more than you should, and it potentially gets scary. And then we're relating that to the idea of, of words showing up randomly after you hear a new word. So if something's new, it gets in the brain, and then you notice it a lot more than you should. So what's the word that they have in this word search too? Or hi? Or are you serious? <laughs> And then, and then we notice it like a billion, billion times too. That's <laughs> no Monogatari. <laughs> then we get on to relating what is happening at the dojo to pandemic panic, a mass infection of knowledge that is new and spreading around and highly volatile at this point in time. We need to curb the pandemic, and initially we bring up the idea of just letting it run its course and do what it needs to do. Of course we can't let it happen in this circumstance because that'll result in the tree dying. We need to change perspective and change tact instead, thinking we have no choice this time but to pursue what we're pursuing. Um, if I didn't talk about it already, I would argue also climbing that wall of boobs representing growth. I'm pretty sure I talked about that a couple of times though. No matter the virus, if it spreads as far as it can, then it's over. If it doesn't have a new thing to latch onto, then it just kind of dies. The tree itself, we, we confirm very early that it's saved as well in this section. We've got the idea of like a, you, you do like a T, this is T, no, and then T, and T and tree, sure. <laughs> sure, and then relating that to pandemic? I don't know about that. You could say that a T is calming for a panic, maybe? I don't know, weird one. So we're meant to take the goal they arrive at and just you know, change it a little bit. Everyone is to the point where they think the tree is spooky. What if it wasn't spooky, it was sacred. It was spiritual instead. We've got to give them a step higher, right? Even using some of this kinky philosophy, right, that we were talking about before. To make things, or to make people change their tact, to make people, to convince them of something, to deceive them, you need to give them a goal that's higher than the one that they have right now, a new attainable thing that helps to remedy things and give them some kind of utility. Of course, suggesting a spiritual bond or something is going to be higher than something merely being spooky, and as a result, be more understandable, I think. So this is what we told everybody, right, to kind of give that reverence to the tree. The old tree was the same tree used to build the sacred dojo. It was planted in the backyard as a guardian deity of the of the of the whole dojo as a whole, right? Again, attaching that aberration quality to it. Giving it godlike status, no. Again, I I had some musings about the Nadeko situation, but I think that this is can be misconstrued into thinking about that as well. Or construed. I don't know if misconstrued is the right word, but, but anyway, this works as um as a way not to get people to chop the the damn thing down. That works for that circumstance. It's kind of like a band-aid solution. I think it's quite clever. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I think only time will tell. What I do know is that the, the cat pajamas that Hanakawa is wearing are cute. And this little story is mostly in service of the students. Of course, the dojo's master would know that it wasn't built off this one tree. If you think about it for a second, that old tree couldn't have been used as the only lumber to create the dojo. It's just not how that works. So the master just sees through it immediately and just goes on with his day. Again, because he's an adult, he doesn't get affected by these kind of things. So Karen's promise fulfilled. Uh, old tree's life was spared. Um, but at what cost, potentially, right? Did we create something new and unexpected from this little journey? Again, relating it broadly to Kaiki, we told a little fib. We told a little lie to make things better. 
but in reality, we just spread a new rumor because it's not true. It's it's a falsehood, right? I don't know. It worked. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't know. I have a lot of musings, but I don't really have a point really for this one. Um, a concrete thing that I know it's trying to say. Again, talking about this perception idea, Araragi's kind of final thoughts of the the episode as well are kind of like, hey, potentially it was just an aberration to begin with, right? It was always this kind of way. We didn't lie about it. We just actually revealed the truth. Even bringing up the idea that it's potentially possible that the tree did actually make the dojo. Even though the possibility is low, it still could have happened. And yeah, even regardless... Because we made up this interpretation, potentially, it now has become one regardless. Because that's how group perception and reality works in Monogatari. Mirroring the, the kind of last shots as well here. So we go like the chime bell into this shot of the tree, which is like the first one of the episode as well. And yeah, that's kind of it. Um, I don't really have like a lot of points. I think I've basically said them all already. Uh, it's, a, it's definitely an interesting one, um, and very broad. I, I'm completely prepared for somebody else to take this in a completely different direction that's maybe better, maybe worse. I don't know. It had a lot of boobs in the episode, so take it, a, take it or leave it, I guess. So yeah, on- onwards and upwards with episode 7, I guess, broadly, if we're continuing our sister thing, maybe a Tsukihi jobby. Um, but we will watch very shortly and see regardless which will be October, which could be many spots in October. It could be before all the stuff with Augie. <laughs> it could be after all the stuff with Augie. Remember those those few arcs of this the kind of starting portion of a Wari Monogatari? That all takes place over a couple of days. Um, and then towards the end is where we get Otori. I think like the 31st, almost Halloween, no? Um, so maybe in the middle of those two, get Araragi's point of view post Sodachi situation. But yeah, we'll, we'll see shortly regardless. Radio got episode 7 up here ready to go. Um, definitely got the right subs on this time. Actual subs. Pretty cool. 12 minutes and 12 seconds on it as well. You know about the picture and picture. And those subs are Toish Y subs. So yeah, just going to give it a 3, 2, 1. Radio, 3, 2, 1, go. Yeah, it is, it is Tsukihi, everybody. This is Platinum Disco for the uninitiated, which I don't know why you're watching this. Also known as a bop. It's a bop in the business. Look at the head length change as well. Now we remember Sukihi Phoenix. She's kind of a weird, inhuman freak. Um, and we hate her for that. Actually, no, we don't. We actually love her for that. It's a beautiful little story about found family and loving a sister regardless of her being an inhuman monster atrocity. And also the first place we really brought up our... Um, broad dichotomy around humans inherently good, inherently bad. That was all this part of the story as well, which is a trip. That was definitely a while ago. But more importantly, it's just a hit. Like, what a song, honestly. No spoilers. This opening may do pretty well when I decide to rank them all. Just heads up. Konomi T? I I saw T at the end of last episode. I remember. Okay, just October? Ooh, the art style? Thoughts? Yes. Well, I mean, yeah. Kinda. Uh... What is happening? Okay. <laughs> what a guess. Okay. Used to appear, so not currently. Hmm. 
no objective proof that such a girl was there. What? No, I think you're trying to speed through things very quickly. Bro, that's some Cendric Ahara tech. She's got that multicolored pen. Okay, it's more formal. I want to do a pull. Yeah, all of them, please. They have a three. We have a four color one in Australia, generally. But nobody uses green. More proof. I don't know. Proof is weird in Monogatari. Okay. Well, that's good. We can go home. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I systematically proved that it didn't exist, but they didn't believe me. Logic. Logic. Logic versus emotion. Kyoka. <laughs> Not the eighth member. You hate it because you can't, like, complete your job. <laughs> okay, that's very funny. Why do we care about... I guess perception is important. Group perception is always important. Because what I'm saying is the truth. But what is the truth? What is correct? I don't know, it's probably more fun for it to be true for everybody. I don't know. I don't know, go get Hanakawa again, you're good at that. <laughs> yeah, you pushed his luck. Well, it's more than your skin, it was your eyeball. Okay, yep. Well, he's got a lot of history in the area. Yeah, it's not it's not binary, it's not logical. <laughs> so that's a threat though. Uh, that's very reassuring. Okay. Good advice for a sister. Yeah. Oh, oh, we're in the we're in the BL mines. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> A lot. Look at the internet.
<laughs> so do you. Okay, it kind of cancels each other out. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I see it as a form of protection. I don't think that'll be necessary. What is that? Hmm. Is it a actual idea or a fake Kambaru idea? Hmm. Oh, lies again. We're ringing up lies. We're already kind of lying to her, right? Yeah, he did show reluctance before. You literally did it last episode. Or no, this episode. Emotion versus logic. Think about it. Um. Yeah, it's fine, but they may be writing it away as that. So you're lying about them coming up with a fake story by making up a fake story. Yeah, that makes you feel good. Again, lying, presenting something better than reality for somebody to believe and be deceived by. I'll be duped this time. Yeah, linking, again, I'm thinking this is linking back into a lot of Kaiki stuff. Thanks, Kambaru. Yeah. I don't know much beyond that, though. You know? I mean, Tsukihi and Deception and Perception, that links into a lot of her arc stuff, right? About, like, she's technically deceiving the Araragi family right now, consciously or not. Do you believe in ghosts when you yourself are kind of a weird aberration person? Aberration? What is an aberration? Have I been saying that the whole time? Aberration. It's like a apparition, aberration word. But either way, I think there's some kinky lying deception stuff going on here. And his words about like kind of groupthink. And uh, needing pre to present, like, a better alternative to deceive somebody. You don't see many people that are satisfied getting deceived, right? So people keep coming to Araki dissatisfied. He deceives them, leaving them satisfied. But in the process, he lies. Is that okay? What is the truth? Lots of questions like that. I don't know. I do not know. Yeah, jumping into a little bit of analysis on episode 7. I believe I have discovered something, um, and I'll bring up the shot that made me realise it. It'd be this one here. Does does this shot look familiar to anybody? Hmm, potentially, potentially we flip it upside down and we see something else. Potentially something like this, no, from the previous episode? 
So that made me think. I'm like, okay, let's let's think about what's different here. One is a very like traditional Japanese look, the previous one, as compared to this one that's more realistic for a monogatari style, uh, less stylized. One is nighttime, one is day, one has a moon, one has a sun. Uh, sun broadly related to Tsukihi through the phoenix idea, whilst moon also related to Tsukihi through her name. So yeah, there's maybe some inversion there. I forget if there was some Karen implication about um, celestial bodies as well. So yeah, that that's a pretty clever inversion already, considering both of these episodes are about the sisters. But then made me think further. I'm like, okay, there's a ton of similarities between the two episodes, right? Let's 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 walk through them. So in this episode that I have right now, episode six, we're talking about Karen who is the one person that doesn't believe the group think about the tree, the, the, the spooky scariness of it all, right? The, um, the, the creepy nature of it, I guess. We have Tsukihi in her situation, who is the one that doesn't really believe the ghost side of the tea club story, right? You could even say, like, what? okay, this is about a tree, we even saw that in this episode, we saw, like, tea being made, right? Being poured. Um, tea is made up of leaves, leaves that come off a tree, right? You see, there's something there, right, as well. We also have two opportunities for Araragi to lie to his sisters over the course of two separate months. We have one lie in this episode that is specifically structured to which Karen knows that it's a lie but still continues to spread it out to everybody else regardless. We don't really explore the the aberration aspects of that and how Karen perceives all of that, right? Actually, I guess it's never said if Karen is in on the lie or not. We just give her something to say. And she says it verbatim, so I don't know. Um, but on the other hand, we have Tsukihi, whose crisis of faith is around ghosts existing, right? If I've logically proved that ghosts don't exist and everybody else still thinks they do through emotional lenses, what does that even mean? What is reality? Maybe I'm the wrong one, right? I'm the odd one out. That would make sense that I'm the wrong one. So we give Tsukihi two separate lies here. We give her the lie that ghosts don't exist, right? Um, that Araragi tells her initially, right? That's the answer to the first question of the episode. Do ghosts exist? No, they don't. Or do you believe in ghosts is the is the correct phrasing there. Then we give her a second lie, a lie about the intentions of her classmates and why they would continue to believe this story, even though it's logically proved as false. It's a logical reason to it, right? It, we give Sukihi a logical reason to it, you know? That's even bringing in some of the Sukihi Phoenix stuff, right? Because we're questioning... Tsukihi's emotions in that, right? We're questioning the validity of them if you're not a real sister, right? It may just be some logical thing, logical response you do just to continue to perpetuate this whole phoenix idea, right? Either way, Tsukihi believes both hook, line, and sinker, right? Interesting. I, I think there's, there's, there's more beyond this as well between these two episodes for sure, uh, linking them, but um... But yeah, I found this fascinating, um, this connection between these two episodes specifically, um, the the connection of the Fire Sisters to Kaiki, the connection of the Fire Sisters to lying, to telling the truth. That was a whole thing in, again, both of their arcs in Nisei. What is Nisei besides, like, fake story, right? That's That's what we're talking about, right? False story, no story, fake story lie story <laughs> um yeah I, I, that's something that is a link between these two episodes it's a reason why these two episodes should be watched in tandem um i can bring up the rest of my notes now i guess which are here i had a little bit of trouble placing this it says october broadly um from memory this is even like late October, a lot of the Awari stuff leading straight into otori which we know is late october so I think that was the implication. Again, I, I've I've popped it here. It could be between Awari, the first part of Awari and Atori, but I've put I've put it just at the start of October just for uh, because I don't see it as particularly relevant 
for a lot of that stuff, besides the lying theme and perception theme that I've already talked about, which is between these two episodes and potentially leading into a worry, broadly. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Sukihi begins the episode by asking Araragi if he believes in ghosts. This is an attempt to gauge his opinion on something that happened at school with the tea ceremony club. Apparently there's a ghost, and despite Sukihi proving that the ghost doesn't exist, with facts and logic, the emotional side of it keeps getting in the way regardless, right? Uh, we've we've talked about um, Owari and the end of Owari in Shinobu Mail, and how there's a conflict between emotion and logic as well, between Shinobu and Kamvaru, as a very la- loud motorcycle passes by. So upon hearing all of this, the initial question, does Aragi believe in ghosts? No, he does not. Au contraire. We know from the rest of the show and its events that ghosts most certainly are real, and Araragi believes in them. Whatever ghosts may be, whatever you want to call them, apparitions, aberrations, oddities, whatever you want to call them. There's lots of different words, even to the point where I'm mixing them up. Araragi then brings this idea to Kambaru, who as well is cognizant of the aberrations of the world, that ghosts do indeed exist, warning Araragi about telling her this little lie. You could also see this little lie as his little protection of Tsukihi, the same way that he is technically lying to Tsukihi that he doesn't know about the Phoenix thing. Um, that's the kind of end of Tsukihi Phoenix as well. Lies to protect her, right? That's similar to, again, where we're lying or where we're specifically trying to keep Karen and Tsukihi out of a bunch of the business we have going on with the rest of the show. Because we don't think it, we think it's dangerous for them, right? We want them to exist on this pure justice mindset instead of having these doubts that have been put upon Araragi by the rest of the events of the show. That being said, this, these doubts may come with time, regardless. But up to this point, they're still relatively clueless about that world, and that's fine. That's good. Either way, after these words from Kambaro, they decide to beef up this lie, being the no, a little bit more. They decide to come up with an actual reason even though it's a fake reason, a deceptive reason for why Tsukihi's classmates behave the way they do. So they lie for Tsukihi's sake, which is important. This is bringing in our Kaiki idea of needing to present something better in a lie to have somebody to believe it, for somebody to be deceived by said lie. So so we're saying that the club, like, knows that she's stealing shit, whether it be small shit or big shit, doesn't really matter. They want to just write it off and not get her in trouble, so they made up this thing about the ghost, and they're very adamant about it to protect Tsukihi. And that makes her feel good, so she believes it, and then goes upon her her merry way. And we're left to wonder which lie does Tsukihi believe? Does she believe the lie about there being no ghosts in the world, about Araragi not believing in ghosts, or the lie about the intention of the classmates in their kind of perpetuation of the ghost lie? Does she believe both? Does she believe neither? We don't know. We do not know. I would say that she believes both. She believes both of these lies by design. Which again is ironic considering her actual form of the phoenix. So yeah, I don't know. I talked about 10 minutes for an episode that I didn't think had much going on. So... (laughs) Monogatari, ladies and gentlemen. So yeah, into the episode proper now that I'll probably motor through a little bit quicker considering... Um, I've talked about most of the content and what I think. It'll just be visual examples to accompany it. The episode here starts with uh, Platinum Disco, which is fantastic. We love Platinum Disco. Um, Again, it's a very good opening. And Koyomi Tea, we understand why it's called tea. It's because of the tea ceremony. I'm also thinking that, like, tea is like tree leaf water, so we're linking that into the tree again. Um, you could broadly maybe make the inference that Koyomi being plant in the metaphor and then drinking the tea and the tea is soothing, so maybe like a lie. Uh, but that is super grasping at straws, so probably not. And here's that first shot, again, mirroring the other shot from the other episode, talking to like a similar situation, but flipped for a different sister potentially. This is one of my favorite shots in Monogatari. I believe we, we've used this one in the past, just kind of outside of the house, looking into that main living room that is... Very weird. Um, I don't know about the ladders, but they've always been there. The first, first line of the episode, do you believe in things like ghosts? Immediately saying, did you hear something from Sengoku? 
Okay, so there'll be the relationship between Sengoku and Tsukihi being kind of sort of friends. So maybe uh, Sengoku would have dropped some details about the whole snake situation and how real that was. And maybe that would have had her asking some questions. Why else would Nadeko's name come up? I do not know. Yeah, again, like broadly trying to keep Tsukihi out of this supernatural world, right? Um, I do forget, but I think that's mainly one of the themes of Nisei Monogatari, trying to separate the sisters from everything else. In the end, I think Karen still believes that she had some kind of, like, terrible disease, right? <laughs> some kind of bee fever. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I forget that one. Again, it's been quite a while. All I really remember from Nisei is the toothbrush scene in all its glory. Araragi makes a good guess and, and, and talks about, hey, maybe there's a ghost in the tea ceremony club, and that's exactly what the story's about. So a ghost used to appear in the tea ceremony club. There's no objective proof that such a girl was ever there. That being rather specific, focusing on such a girl as our little thing. Um, there's no evidence of it. There's no evidence left that such a thing ever occurred. Let me tell you some good news. The fact that there's no evidence means there wasn't a ghost. And yeah, this this <laughs> this gets a pretty angry response out of Tsukihi, because again, this is like missing the problem, right? It's not that, yeah, I, I know ghosts don't exist. I have evidence to prove that they don't exist. Or the lack of evidence to prove that they don't exist, if that makes any sense, right? Why would I believe they exist if I don't have any evidence? That's the natural state of the world. And prematurely tries to end the conversation so we could spend the rest of the time in idle chatter instead of about whatever you wanted to talk about. But she's frustrated, right? And goes to the pen. And the pen's interesting, right? Because pen stationary into body face parts is Senjugahara's thing. So potentially they've been learning off Senjugahara um, ever since they met at the end of Nisei, again, it's like Araragi's like, hey, I'm going to introduce you to my girlfriend, Sendra Gahara. That's like the end of Nisei, right? And yeah, he's, he's, he, he dodges the pen. He's had a lot of practice. Generally, Sendra Gahara will go for a pair of scissors or a pencil, though. Or a stapler, I guess. So then we get into the situation proper. We're trying to... We're, 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 we're guessing what happened with Tsukihi in the club, right? Um, that she essentially proved that there was no ghost. Rumors spread around the ghost, or about a ghost, in the tea ceremony club. Tsukihi, not as part of the Fire Sisters, but independently as her own, right? It, this isn't upon the kind of, like, want of her to perpetuate justice. It's more like a personal dislike of the occult? Is this what we're implying with this line? Which is an interesting one. So yeah, she was able to orderly and logically explain to them that the ghost doesn't exist with... A ton of different evidence, but none of them believe me. They believe in the ghost more than they believe in me. You're trying to, you're not trying to deceive, but you're trying to convince people of something, right? Are you offering a situation for them that is more interesting or better or more hopeful than what they have currently? Maybe people are emotional, they're not logical, and they want to just believe that the ghost exists because it's kind of cool. Um, I think you're failing to see that in the logical view that you have of the situation, Sukihi. There's seven members in the club, there was a rumor of an eight, like eyewitness accounts and circumstantial evidence, and I logically disproved each of them. We have this playing out on a stage. Hmm, not a stage. We love a, we love a good stage in Monogatari. It's actually a pretty good set, too. So again, world is a stage. She's on the stage. What's happening behind the stage? What is up above the stage? It's aberrations. Remember our little metaphor there? Are you fit for the stage? Potentially. I would, I would say that she is, right? In our grand little metaphor, right? Are you fit to be part of this story? Yeah. You, you're, you're a layman, right? But also, you, you, you may be far too logical for that as well. You're not, you're not like that stereotypical version of the story that we've seen in the past that Kaiki really gravitates towards, ones that are potentially easier to deceive and, and more naive. But you are easy to deceive because you're deceived in the end. Am I rambling? Maybe, maybe not. But this show gets me rambling, you know? Araragi even yelling directions from the crowd, watching along as she tries to tell the story on the stage. Like, stop using the word logically so much, it just makes you seem more unbelievable. And then we see little Sherlock holmes -y type outfit, even still got the little hairpin there as well. Yeah, perceiving all sorts of stuff to figure out that, hey, this, you know, it doesn't exist. It's, it's not logical, right? 
and everyone is maybe kind of stupid. That may be how it is, but well, like, despite evidence to the contrary, I still believe this. Which, again, this is a very teenage emotion. Like, not understanding that people just do this. People will, with large amounts of evidence to the contrary, still believe the opposite. It's just what people do. And it's frustrating for Tsukihi, right? Yeah, these rumors won't go away at all. You don't get the satisfaction of beating the case, basically. I do like this uh, the, this shot of her like, stamping her foot, though. It's, it's quite excellent. <laughs> what should I do, Onijan? What should I do, brother? Um, I keep asserting these things, these things that are correct, right? Um, things like opposition and battling with opinion on the matter should be done. It should just be a collective truth of the world. Again, something we were grappling with in the previous episode in Koyomi Tree, right? Perception, right? Like, I've said what is logically the correct answer here where Karen kind of said what well, logically wasn't the correct answer and everyone just kind of believed it anyway. Like, why don't they believe me? I'm correct. <laughs> so despite all my work, what did I even do? What's correct is meaningless. What matters is perception. You can even see this as almost these three shadows here off the cup, right? Like, what matters is what it, whichever way you're perceiving this from. Like, she may be on this side of the table, but I think from different points of view, from different sources of light you may be getting a different result, a different shadow. So they didn't counter the argument, they merely ignored it. For this case, how should I go about giving her advice? This being Araragi thinking. And Araragi asks, well, what do you want me to do, basically? You have a shocked look on your face, even with that reprimanding tone of voice and a shocked look on your face, which results in pen, pen action, which, you know, he just, he was very, he was quite rude. We don't want that. And yeah, instead of a what that she wants from Araragi, she just wants his opinion. Like, do some research, like, collect information from some people that are potentially older than me that I maybe respect, sometimes. So, do you believe in ghosts? Right back to the starting question of the conversation. And he says, hmm, he looks troubled, right? He's troubled trying to answer, because again, he does believe in ghosts, because ghosts actually exists. That's his perception of what is correct. But, again, I'm thinking there's some broad feelings around protecting Tsukihi from this world, from this information, letting her follow her own path instead, right? And he says no, and I like the way they do it. First they do it with the hair, if I can go back to it. Here. No. There's, and there's one quick look before turning his eyes away. I don't believe in ghosts. The other tea ceremony club members are all mistaken. I guarantee you're correct, don't worry about it. You should stay true to yourself and push forward with your correctness but still seems broadly troubled, even after being confirmed as correct. So then it took me a while to perceive what's going on. I'm like, why are we in a mind shaft? Question mark. And what is this red? What is red? What I didn't know is it wasn't red, it was Reed, because it's a bunch of BL. He's in the BL mines mining out the mess of whatever's in Kambara's room. Apparently the mess has got so bad that you need mine shafts to go out and clear the debris. So, you know. And Araragi gets to talking about it. Whatever this is, it doesn't threaten the existence of the club. It's more that it's had Tsukihi hit a wall. For her, a hero of justice, it must be uncomfortable to be in an environment where what's correct is being ignored. Because what is justice beyond the determination of what is correct? you know, the, the criminal justice system. What is a court? What are we trying to do there? We're trying to assert the truth. If the truth is barely ignored by whoever receives it, then what am I even doing here? And again, I, I think broadly, Aragi's protecting Tsukihi from the realizations that, hey, justice isn't all it's cracked up to be and may not be the be all end all of everything. She may need to find that herself instead of being guided by me. Again, these situations often happen in real life. It's the it's an understanding as you get older that it doesn't always play out the way you want it to play out. We find out that he's conversing with Kambaru in this conversation, um, agreeing with Tsukihi initially, but being accused of agreeing only because she's cute. But apparently there's six other members, so I'm not being swayed by that because there's other cute girls as well. Kanbaru moment. But again, that's where we're trying to side with Tsukihi in this case, right? We know about the aberrations and, and all that, right? We know how irrational, illogical, and crazy, and supernatural, and everything that they are, right? We see people like Tsukihi continuing to believe in reality 
as almost sacrificing her actual perception of what's really going on for reality's sake. If everybody believed in aberrations, I think the world would turn into chaos. There's an important reason why the community is pretty secretive, right? Because group perception, as I keep talking about, is so important in Monogatari. I think on top of this, there's also some personal stuff from Araraki, and wanting to protect sisters broadly from other stuff. We suggest Kambaru potentially, like, infiltrating the school or something. This is probably referential, but, but sure. No, that's not really what we want. And Kambaru comes up with an idea, you, you know, to, to fix everything, right? We want to get Tsukihi-chan in a good mood for the time being. There's a way. There's a way to get her to get out of this little slump that she's in about the ghost situation. But there's one catch to this solution. It means, as a result, you'll be deceiving her, right? Are you going to be okay with that? Are you reluctant to lie to your little sisters? Laugh? There's no way that I would be. Because he lies to them, basically, or he's already lied to her in this episode about the whole ghosts thing. But is lying good? Is lying bad? Lying to protect other people rather than deceiving them out of money, which is like the kaiki idea? I don't know. You're still following those same principles of getting somebody to believe a lie. So, I don't know. And then we get to explaining, hey, why did the tea ceremony club adamantly believe in this eighth member? It's to protect Tsukihi because she used to, like, steal supplies and stuff. It's essentially Araragi in this situation is trying to apply a sensible explanation to the absurd. To, again, what the group members are believing is absurd. But we want to appeal to Tsukihi and her sense of logic in trying to convince her, right? So there's a logical reason why they're illogical. It's to protect you. It's to keep you safe through the process of a lie. And Kamaru is pretty smart in applying the logic here. She's got some pretty good problem-solving skills there. How did we know that she stole stuff from the club? I don't know, but we did. And we applied that to the lie, and... You know, you kind of see her face here. She's kind of believing it hook, line, and sinker, like, immediately. Yeah, she, she loves it. So that's it. Everyone did it for me. That fool was instantly deceived. And there I was, tactlessly saying that ghosts didn't exist. My thoughtless attitude itself was the ghost. Kinda. <laughs> I'll be duped this time. I'll be duped for their sake. This also resonates weirdly, like believing a lie for somebody else's sake. So the tea ceremony or Araragi, which one did she decide to be fooled by? Interesting, right? Because this line here, like, I'll choose to be duped. Is this, is this her reaction here, like, like her surprised look here? Is this her believing Araragi's lie or believing the lie that we made up about the, the tea ceremony members? You know what I mean, right? Does she believe what he says, or is she humoring him? Is she humoring the tea club members, or is she going to humor Araragi even in this moment right now? And that's the question. Who did she decide to be deceived by? Was it both? I don't know. Was it neither? I don't know. Well, it wasn't neither, obviously. She's she's pretending to be duped by one of them. But anyway, um, interesting episode upon recollection, for sure. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I don't, I don't not have much to say. I think I said a lot about it. I don't have much more to say, I don't think. It certainly was an interesting one. I'll give them that. And more and more I'm realizing the connection between the two episodes and why they should be viewed in tandem. Um, these ones both relating to the sisters, both being kind of twists on that same groupthink perception logic about... Groups of people believing or not believing certain things, and we need Araragi to help with things. We go to Kambaru, we go to Hanakawa to help with said situations. It's broadly about a tree, and then a tree about some tea, and then tree and tea kind of sound similar as well, so something. And yeah, about lying to the Fire Sisters, or providing lies and deception to the Fire Sisters to do with what they need to do with it, right? Was there some stuff in Tsukihi Phoenix about continuing to be duped by Tsukihi. Like, you've been duped by her because she's actually a phoenix bird thing. And then Araragi's like, okay, I'll continue to believe that lie because it's it's better for me. Is that kind of a reflection on that concept as well? But again, Nisei Monogatari has been such a long time away, it's hard to talk about. As well as, of course, the, the Kaiki connection to both of the sisters as well and how this kind of, like, episode five 
of Koyomi Monogatari being about deception and how we do it with with the wind and then moving that into the tree, applying said deception in both cases with each of the separate sisters. So maybe Araragi did learn a thing or two from that little talk with Kaiki at the donut shop. Again, like it's very unstructured, it's very rambly, my thoughts on these two episodes, but I think I found something here regardless. And yeah, I think some broad stuff into Awari, but less so than the other episodes, I would think. So yeah, I've had text throughout the video here kind of explaining a few thoughts as I went through, but I just wanted to make sure that I really say it here. Uh, this episode and these two episodes are very, very obviously linking to, I guess, Araragi's crisis of justice towards the start of Awari Monogatari with the classroom stuff. That's why we're involving the Justice Sisters. That's why there are two situations in which one person potentially knows the truth and we're trying to convince a group of something and it may lead to, I guess, a crisis of their own belief in justice and potentially lying to these sisters or providing them with lies to help protect their sense of justice, kind of bringing forth a lot of those Nisei Monogatari themes around... I want you to keep being the Justice Sisters. I don't want to stop that, regardless of my own opinions on justice as formed through that classroom situation. And yeah, that's very, very obviously the link to Awari. So yeah, I, I finally got it by the very end. But again, we'll leave it at that. I'm, I'm, I've tried to close up a number of times before I keep thinking about different things. So I'll just close up for good. These were good episodes. Should watch three next week, followed by two, which will wrap up Koyomi Monogatari. Um, broadly still enjoying it. These ones were both kind of slower, but, um, I mean, <laughs> they, they were good. I enjoyed myself. I had a lot to say, so must have did something right. Um, shill stuff before I finish as well. If you like the video, consider liking the video. If you like the video and you want to see more, consider subscribing to the channel. Comment below anything you thought about the episode, anything I could do to improve my presentation, if I can speak. Um, comment below. Um, follow for follow on Twitter. Discord. Join the Discord if you feel so inclined. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the video now, but these were cool. So join me again next week for more Monogatari and, and that kind of stuff. We'll, we'll do some more Koyomi Monogatari together. Again, looking forward to comments. Um, radio, I'm, I'm, I'm signing off now. Goodbye. <laughs>